Welcome back. All right, so I've talked about the Vancouver Canucks and why I have some issues with the organization. Now I want to talk about the Arizona Coyotes because when I'm talking about organizations, I feel like Arizona's doing well. And I've seen a lot of comments along the lines of, what's he talking about? What's he looking at? Arizona's terrible. Except that they're not. Now, the on-ice product over the last couple of years has been bad by design. But there's definitely a plan at play here. We'll see how it all turns out because, again... Getting above the playoff line, becoming a contender, easier said than done, but I think the Coyotes have done a good job. One thing I want to mention is, when the Tempe Entertainment District fell through, we expected that they'd have a hard time signing players, that guys would want out. And immediately there was talk of Clayton Keller wanting out. But Keller squashed that rumor, and we haven't heard anything else about it. So while people on the outside look at the Arizona situation and say they're playing in Mullet Arena... It's too small. They don't have a game plan going forward. Tampa fell apart, moved the team. So, when I'm talking about the organization, and I'm talking about what they're doing right, it doesn't mean that I'm saying that there's not uncertainty when it comes to where they're going to play a few years down the road. However, uh, I, when I'm talking about organizations, I have to look at how they're doing on the ice, how they're doing with cap management, and honestly, how the Coyotes have done a good job of adding draft picks in exchange for taking on contracts other teams don't want to pay anymore. And sometimes those are players who play for them, and they turn those players around, and sometimes they don't, right? So let's go through this. The first thing I want to talk about is draft picks. When a team's in a rebuild, you expect not only a lot of draft picks, but some pretty good hits. Now, they've had a hard time with hits. Got to be honest, 2017, they draft Pierre-Olivier Joseph at 23. Uh, they had nine picks in that draft, but he's the one that stands out. Uh, 2018, they draft Barrett Hayden at 5. They drafted Ivan Prozvatov at 114. They had 9 picks that year. I believe that was the year they drafted Kevin Ball as well, but he's not with the Coyotes anymore, of course. 2019, they drafted Victor Soderstrom at 11, and the jury's still out on what Soderstrom might be. The difference with Arizona, as compared to some of the other teams, is uh, Soderstrom and the Coyotes aren't under the same level of scrutiny as other teams are around the NHL. So if Soderstrom ends up being a bust at the NHL level, it's not a big deal. Uh, but Matias Michelli at 98 is a hit. So they had nine draft picks that year as well. That's 27 draft picks in three years. Now, 2019-2020, they went for it. They absolutely went for it. It ended up being a mistake. Their first round, their first draft pick that year was at 111. They drafted Mitchell Miller. They, of course, rescinded that pick. And they only had five picks that year. So 2020 was a disaster. Not going to lie. But 2021, they make up for it. They get the Canucks first round draft pick. They draft Dylan... Gunther, Goche, what was I thinking? Uh, J.J. Mosier at 60, so those are two really good picks out of the nine they had. Uh, 2022, Logan Cooley's drafted third. At 11, they draft Connor Geeky, and at 29, they draft Ma Maverick Lamaru. That's out of 10 draft picks. Now, the beauty of that is Cooley is seen as he's a star player potentially in the NHL. He should, at the very least, be a top six forward. That's a good pick. Connor Geeky, seen as a pretty decent pick, too. So then with the third pick of that draft with Maverick Lamaru, a guy who's seen as probably being, you know, second or third rounder, well, it's okay. You've you've added two draft picks early on that look like they're they're guaranteed. Go for the guy who might be a home run. Go for the guy who might end up being a good player that you think you see something there. You can afford to take a little more of a risk when you've already had two draft picks in that first round and they had 10 picks overall. 2023, they draft uh, Dmitry Simashev at six. They draft Daniil Boot at 12. And they had 12 picks this year in what's a very deep draft. And in the last couple of drafts, a lot of those picks are in the first three rounds. And we know that with each subsequent round, the odds of finding an NHL player, they drop. So they've done a very good job of having draft picks. So their trading has been pretty good too. They added a 2023 fifth with Shea Weber. They traded nothing to add the Shea Weber contract, which they could do because they had the cap space. Uh, they added extra picks and deals for Patrick Nemeth, Zach Cassian, Anton Strollman uh, for Roussel and all of the other soon-to-be expired contracts from Vancouver, which was Erickson and Beagle as well. Uh, Gostas Bear, they got for nothing. Uh, Ladd, they picked up his contract. And when they traded Aiden Hill, they have added a draft pick as well. They picked up Kozanosh. Now, of course, Aiden Hill ends up in Vegas, but at the time that Arizona trades him, he wasn't going anywhere in Arizona anyways. So if you want to take a look at the Hill trade and say, well, that was kind of a loss. Look at Hill with the Stanley Cup. You can do that, but the other trades still age pretty well. 
Uh, they can afford to add the money because they're not spending the money. Uh, now, the oops, and there's been a couple of oopses here. Uh, I think trading for Taylor Hall in 2019 was an error. Straight up going to say that was an error on their part. Um, maybe they felt like they were closer than what they were, but that did look like an error because they traded a first-round draft pick uh, for him. Uh, and trading Pierre-Olivier Joseph in the Kessel deal, looking back, man, Pierre-Olivier jo Joseph, a decent defenseman, but they have a solid defense core as it is. So that's a little bit of an oops. But I know P.O. Joseph, uh, popular with some. Uh, so they have three second-round picks in 2024. They have three third-rounders next year as well. Uh, 2025, they have four second-round draft picks. They have two fourth-rounders in 2025. And they have three second-round draft picks in 2026. This team is awash in draft picks between now and 2026. Why that's substantial is those draft picks are valuable. Uh, this shows that they're in a rebuild, but it also means that if this team starts getting better this year, they might be able to turn a couple of those draft picks into a player at the deadline because they have cap space. They have almost $4 million in cap space. And in the event that they decide, you know what, we're going to go for it, well, a lot of these contracts they've added then go on LTIR. They don't even need to put them on LTIR. So they have an advantage built in, right? They have an advantage built in over other teams in the league. And I understand that people will say, well, they don't have a very good team. But look at the possible line combinations. I got Kerfoot on the fourth line because I'm trying to figure out who I would drop out of the top three lines. So you've got Keller, Hayden, and Schmaltz as your first line. Excellent second half to the season. Go check the stats. Those three guys were on fire towards the end of the season. Michelli, and I'm going to say Michelli, Cooley, and Gunther on that second line. Uh, although Kerfoot could end up on that second line, Gunther could end up playing further down. If Logan Cooley has a smooth transition into the NHL, this team could score a bunch of goals above what's expected, which would put Zucker on the third line with Bugstad and Kraus. So Bugstad, uh, a player who was rented out at the deadline, he comes back. Kraus is an excellent, strong, big forward. And Zucker comes over. He scored 27 goals last year. This team could have three scoring lines. So again... Maybe Kerfoot ends up being the third line center. Bugstad drops to the fourth line, plays with Carconi and McBain. Carconi had an excellent season in the AHL last year, and McBain can hit. So you could end up with a fourth line that plays pretty well too, right? You could have four good lines for the Arizona Coyotes. The defense is where things get a little bit sketchier, and I will admit that. Uh, you got Mosier, you got Dumba. Dumba, of course, on a, on a one-year contract. We'll see if he has a bounce back from a rough year. Valimaki, who they turned around after acquiring him from Calgary. Uh, Dursey brought over from L.A. He's going to be counted on to take the take over on the power play and, and score some power play points. Five on five, can Valimaki cover for him if that's his pairing? We'll see. Uh, and then you've got Stetcher and Josh Brown on the third pairing. Well, Stetcher won't hurt you on the third pairing. Josh Brown, all right. Uh, so I'm not saying that's a great defense, but it's not awful. And again, this is a team that's got all kinds of draft picks. they got all kinds of prospects coming up. And the roster's not bad either. Uh, goaltending, you got Vimelka and Ingram. Vimelka sometimes overrated, I think. Ingram sometimes underrated. And together, they were okay. And then you've got the dead money. So this is where people have a problem with Arizona. That dead money. Well, you've got Voracek, who expires next summer. You've got Little expires next summer. And then Weber expires in 2026. Eventually, the Shea Weber contract comes to an end. So they're not going to need to buy them out. The plan is, at this point, to have a new arena open for the fans in 2026 for the 2026 2027 season and word has it they're not going to add any dead money that goes beyond 2026 there's the possibility they add another dead contract another guy who's not going to play again but i don't think they're going to it feels like that's done the voracek little weber that's it that's what they're going to do now when we look at their contracts honestly they do a pretty good job with contracts too You've got, you've got Clayton Keller at $7.15 million till 2028. That is a bargain. No matter what way you look at it, it's a bargain. Uh, he is He's a star player, and I think if he was on an expiring contract this year, you'd be looking at at least $9 million for Keller. Uh, Schmaltz, $5.85 million till 2026. He's been on the first line, and again, he had a great second half to the season. Zucker at $5.3 million for one year. They can afford that, no problem. Uh, Kraus, $4.3 million till 2027. Again, he's big, he hits, and he can score goals. He's he's pretty valuable in today's game. 
Uh, Kerfoot, $3.5 million until 2025. Again, they can afford to sign these guys to more money than maybe other teams do, which is something to keep in mind. I'll come back to that in a moment. Michelli, $3.425 million until 2026. So even if Michelli has a rough second year, and if it shows that last year he just had a really good year and everything kind of falls apart, even if worst case scenario, $3.425 million, not a big deal for the Coyotes at this point. And then on the blue line, you got Dumba for one year at $3.9 million. You've got Dursey for a year at $1.7 million. He's a restricted free agent next summer. You've got Vimelka at $2.725 million until 2025. So even if all of this falls apart, a lot of these players, if they decide to flip them, they can. Uh, they're not on really overly expensive contracts that's going to make them that tough to flip if they have to. And they can afford to eat some of that remaining money which when you've got so many guys who are due in 2024, and most of their blue line has an expiring contract in 2024, you're not in bad shape. Uh, now, according to Cap Friendly, for next year currently, and again, they've got to sign some guys, but they have $42,179,357 in cap space next year. So why would I be bullish on the Coyotes? They've got a very good prospect pool. They have shown that they can get players to stay. They can get players to come back. They can sign free agents. They have good cap space. They don't have really expensive contracts. They don't have that anchor contract. You look at it and go, wow, that's a terrible deal. And management seems to have a plan here. There definitely seems to be the rebuild. And while I didn't understand the rebuild as much in 2020 as I do now, because in 2020 I was like, they're not even done the rebuild. How can they do a rebuild? But the reality is that, that what they're doing now looks like it should work, right? So I have some faith that, that this plan should go through because, again, when you're a team that doesn't make the playoffs, you should have cap space. So going back to the Vancouver video I did earlier today, they've missed the playoffs consistently, never had a lot of draft picks, never had a lot of cap space. The Arizona Coyotes missed the playoffs regularly, tons of cap space, tons of draft picks. So that's that to me is the difference right there. And you can get into how the Coyotes have just been bad and the Canucks haven't been as bad. But at the end of the day, if your team misses the playoffs by four points or your team misses the playoffs by 24 points, you're still not playing games in the playoffs. And the concept isn't just getting above the playoff line. It's like, hey, you want to do something when you make the playoffs. And you need really good young players to do that. And there is a good young core being rounded out here with the Coyotes. A team that, you know, their picks this year, there were some that didn't like Simashev and Boot as the picture as the picks for this year. But again, they've they've been pretty good with their picks over the years. Uh, so they also have, uh, in, in the minors as depth up front, they have John Leonard, Milos Kellerman, uh, you have Zach Sanford, Justin Kirkland, all of them played games last year. And so you've got guys who can jump in when there's injuries. And on the blue line, they have that too. Victor Soderstrom, who probably ends up being the number seven defenseman, I would think maybe switches out with Josh Brown. Uh, Michael Kesselring, who looked good after the acquisition from Edmonton. He did. He actually looked all right. Um, I'm not saying he was great. He's going to make you forget about other players that, uh, that the Coyotes have had in the past, but Kessel ring didn't look out of place. And, uh, you have Vladislav Kolyachanik as well. Kolyachanik came up and played some games for them last year too. And of course, in net, you've got Prozvatov. And if Prozvatov doesn't make it, you've got a ton of cap space to add a goaltender next year. If you choose to, you've got a ton, lots. So this is a team that has cap space, flexibility. They have a lot of contracts expiring in 2024 when we know the cap's supposed to go up. And they're in good shape. They're in a good spot to get better quickly if they choose to or continue with the, the slow plotting improvement. Now, when I say that, 2019-2020, when they got into the playoffs via upsetting the Nashville Predators in the qualifying round, uh, they had a 529 winning percentage. Would not have been a playoff team in the event that we'd had just one through eight and your normal playoffs uh, in 2020, but it was not normal. 2020, 2021, 482 was their points percentage. And then they said, ah, we'll just, we'll just tear it down. Okay. So 2021, 2022, a 348 winning percentage, this, or points percentage. And this year that went up to 427. And looking at this line up here, I could see them being in a 480, 490 kind of points percentage, maybe even 500. And under Andre Turney, they have won games that people would not expect. They have shown that they're tough to play against. Uh, if they can be a little more defensively sound, if they can get that, that goaltending from Vimelka that he seems to bring in the big games against the really big name teams, if he can play that way against everybody, they could be tough. So this is why I'm I'm bullish on the Coyotes. 
uh, as a team and I talk about the improvements. Now, when I ranked the organization, I didn't put them, you know, that high up, I thought. I thought I was, you know, fair in ranking them in the second half of the league because until you're in the playoffs and until that, that plan comes to fruition, it's tough to really grade them. But I think they're on the right track. And so this is why I think they're on the right track. This is a good forward group. Again, not great. Good forward group. Their defense, uh, we'll see how it turns out for them. Their goaltending can be good. And so there's a reason to be optimistic if you're a Coyotes fan. The the fact that the, the building and all the discussion about what's going to happen with the building overshadows the rest of this team, I think is a shame. I think it's an absolute shame that it overshadows everything else. But maybe that helps... Maybe it helps it, as a GM of the team, as a coach of the team, to have all that other distraction. As long as it's not negatively impacting the team, as long as it's not preventing players from coming in, well, that's not your problem. You just go out, you win your games. If you're a player, you go out and you play well. And again, when you see guys like Bugstad, Stetcher, saying, well, we're going to go back to Arizona as free agents, I think that's good. I had to cough there. So I, I, I think that that's something that, because I talked about this before, Players talk. And so if you get it out, if you get that, that message out there that, hey, we're having a lot of fun in Arizona, other players can be like, you know what? I wouldn't mind playing in Arizona. I'm not going to have that that public scrutiny. I'm, I'm not going to have to deal with every shift being, you know, gone over with a fine tooth comb. I, I wouldn't mind it. And it's a nice warm environment. Yes, it's a small building. Yes, they need a new arena. Will that keep big names from signing there? Maybe. But next summer could be big between because between now and then they're going to come up with a a plan of some sort. Uh, they they should in January have that announcement on where they intend to build, whether it's in Phoenix, whether it's in Scottsdale, uh, whether it's in Mesa, wherever they end up the, deciding to build that arena, that should be cleared up in January. And for the negative people that want to say, well, the team's not going to make it, and they should move, they should move. Nothing's going to satiate them. They're going to continue to say that. Uh, but if Arizona gets that building in place for the 2026-2027 season, we know that means the team is stable and they're staying in Arizona. So, again, you know, for the Arizona Coyotes, it's always going to be that divisive topic. But I like what they're doing at the draft. I like what they're doing with their salary cap. Uh, I like their lineup and how it's coming together. This is a fun team to watch. When I rated them as one of the top 10 teams in the league last year that I was enjoying watching, that threw some people off. Because again, I watch all of the hockey games. I watch all 32 teams as equally as I can. And I was really enjoying the Coyotes. I was like, you know what? There's something here. And I, I can't help but feel like there's something here that can build. And it now it's about getting that, you know, to that next level. But I, I like what they've put together. I think there's there's a plan. And of course, how that plan turns out in the end, we don't know yet. It's that great unknown. But I, I think they're in good shape. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. As always, don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happen to pause in this video. But hey, thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon. And I'll have a better outro next time too, I, I swear. Just slurring that finish. What was that about? Thanks again for all your support. I will talk to you guys soon enough.